Conway Hall, London, where ethics matter. The next session, we are going to be talking about fearsome fairies, haunting tales of the Fae. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, fairy folklore was sanitised to a huge degree. But in wider folklore, the creatures of the Fae are much more settling and otherworldly. Elizabeth Durnley is a folklorist, artist and researcher based at the University of London and the University of Wolverhampton. Her book, Fearsome Fairies, Haunting Tales of the Fae, is available at the back and she will be signing them at the end of the session. Um, her talk will be about 30 minutes or so and she'll have time for Q&A afterwards. Um, so if you do want to ask any questions, just a reminder, a question is usually one sentence and it goes up at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, because there are people at home on Zoom and they won't be able to hear any statements or, or, um, or speeches that anybody gives. In fact, uh, Elizabeth will be uh, repeating the question in, before she gives her answer for that very reason, so that we can include all the people on Zoom. So thank you very much and give me a great hand for Elizabeth Durnley. Hi everyone, thanks ever so much and it's really great to be here and doing an event in person, it's actually amazing, so um, great to be here. So yeah, I'm Elizabeth Durnley and I've just published Fierce and Fairies, came out last week and there's a, yeah, some books at the back as well, so it's really exciting. My, my author copies arrived two days ago, so I've been, you know, it's really exciting to see them in the flesh. But anyway, I want to start off today with a simple question, so let's see now if I can, there we go. My question is, do you believe in fairies? Anybody here? Yes? No? Not sure? Yeah, I've seen a few hands. So it's actually, it's not a question with a simple answer. It's, it's a lot more complex than it maybe first seems. But uh, as we'll see, it's something that one, people have been coming back to over the centuries. So what are fairies? What, what relationship do they have with the physical world? Uh, and what might make them potentially frightening uh, or at least unsettling. So today I want to explore a few of these ideas about fairies, as well as take a look at a few of the stories that are in Fierce and Fairies itself. So what are fairies? What makes them frightening or potentially frightening? And what stories have been told about them? So one of the best stories about fairy belief is probably the Cottingley fairies. So I imagine lots of people here will probably already know this story. Um, two young girls from Cottingley near Bradford in West Yorkshire, which is where I'm from. So my, my great-grandparents used to live in, Cotting, in Ferrydale in Cottingley, so it's a bit of a personal connection there. Um, and two girls, nine-year-old Frances Griffiths and 16-year-old Elsie Wright, claimed to have taken photographs of fairies uh, near Cottingley Beck in the summer of 1917. So Arthur Conan Doyle got hold of these photographs and he came to believe in them wholeheartedly and published a story in the Christmas 1920 issue of The Strand magazine where he says, quote, should the incidents here narrated hold their own against the criticism they will excite, it is no exaggeration to say that they will mark an epoch in human thought. And a couple of years later, he published a book about the fairies, uh, The Coming of the Fairies, so 20, uh, 1922, so next year it's the centenary, uh, in the same year that he published The Case of Spirit Photography, because he was, of course, a spiritualist as well. So the Cottingley Fairies story became this international media sensation, this lightning rod, really, for much wider discussions about uh, belief, photographic trickery and the limits of photography, spiritualism, scientific rationalism, and it all kept coming back to that same question, do you believe in fairies? So Conan Doyle in The Coming of the Fairies really tries to puzzle out what exactly a fairy might be. You know, are they part insect, for instance? You know, what, what species are they? So he says, uh, the elves are a compound of the human and the butterfly, and the gnome has more of the moth. So we can see this, this kind of... Uh, like teasing out the different varieties. But he concludes that 
I must confess, after months of thought, I am unable to get the true bearing of these little folk that appear to be our neighbours with only some small difference of vibration to separate us. So, a hundred years later, um, the Cottingley Fairies are normally remembered as one of the most famous photographic hoaxes in history. It's, it's such a great story, the creative Sherlock Holmes being hoodwinked by a couple of children. Uh, so, in the 1980s, the, the women, uh, now old women, finally confessed how they'd made the photographs with paper cutouts and hat pins. So, here are a couple of headlines, um, one from the Telegraph and Argus, the local Bradford newspaper, which broke the story, and the other one is from the Arizona Republic. So, you can see it, again, went international. Uh, people were just so fascinated by the story. But again, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So, Francis claimed until her death that the fifth and final photographs that they'd taken was a genuine one. So that's the middle picture here, uh, so you can, you can judge for yourselves. Uh, and she, uh, well, uh, her daughter published a memoir uh, of Frances's own uh, recollections about the fairies in 2009, Reflections on the Cottingley Fairies. Uh, and there was also a paranormal researcher called Joe Cooper, who uh, followed the case for years, was really devastated to find out that it wasn't actually real and the women had actually been lying to him for, for decades. Um, so again, it's a, it's a really interesting story and in that the children of these, uh, all the families involved are now sort of continuing some of the stories and doing work with the Media Museum in Bradford, which is where a lot of the uh, archives are uh, there in the Brotherton Library in Leeds. Uh, so I think the level of public interest in these over the years says so much really about this collective desire to believe in the supernatural and also taps into a much older uneasiness as to what fairies actually are. Are they these pretty butterfly-like creatures or something much more ambiguous? So this is a Google image search I did yesterday for fairies and you can see the kind of things that come up We've got Tinkerbell, uh, sort of very, very sort of pretty fairies, maybe some, some paintings. Um, and I think a lot of popular images of fairies today fall into this category. You know, we think of Disney films, we think of Flora, Fauna and Merryweather in Sleeping Beauty. Um, so they're these quite sort of delicate uh, creatures. Uh, but sort of more widely and historically, they've, they've been much more unpredictable and formidable figures. So I want to just talk about some of these um, how they've developed over time. So links between fairies and death and the underworld go back a long way. The Irish term for fairies, she, literally means mound or hill. Um, then there are many, many local legends about fairies reached through openings in rocks or hillsides. So to go back to the late 13th, early 14th century, the Middle English poem Sir Orfeo retells Orpheus and the underworld as a fairy abduction story. So we're told that uh, Sir Orfeo, uh, whose wife has been, been taken by the fairy king, um, travels into the rock, and when he's gone at least three miles, he comes to this beautiful country, as bright as the sun on a summer's day, smooth, flat, and green. And the whole land was always light when it should have been dark and night. So if you don't know this poem, do, do go and read it. Um, it's, there's a little extract from it in the book, but uh, the whole thing is just, just on the internet and various translations as well, so do, do check it out. So fairies don't seem to have acquired wings and all quite late on. So the first image of a fairy with wings is believed to be this one here uh, by Thomas Stothard for Pope's Rape of the Lock in 1798. Uh, and this idea that fairies might also be winged creatures gave them further associations with the souls of the dead, which are often associated with moths and butterflies in many different cultures. So some people also thought they might be fallen angels. So, for instance, Robert Kirk, sorry, Robert Kirk uh, wrote a treatise on fairies in the late 17th century, which was eventually published in 1815 by Andrew Lang, here with the coloured fairy books. Uh, and he suggests that these she's, or fairies, are said to be of a middle nature betwixt man and angel, as were demons thought to be of old. So again, we get this kind of ambiguity. You know, are, they, are they angelic? Are they demonic? Are they human? Are they something in between? Um, and in all the accounts that we see over the years, we sort of get this picture built up of these, these shadowy creatures that are always just flickering on the edges of consciousness, flickering on the edges of the known world, and they're really hard to pin down. 
So in the 19th century, um, folklore began to take shape as an academic discipline, and Victorian Britain developed an enormous fascination with fairies. Um, and again, um, thinking back to Conan Doyle, they also drew on other emerging theories to find new ways of thinking about fairies, so notably the theory of evolution. So Darwin's On the Origin of Species was published in 1859 and had an enormous cultural impact. And this, in turn, made people speculate about the origins of fairies. So had they simply taken a different path to that of humans? So this chart is one of the favorite things that I found when I was researching this book. This is Charles Ledbetter's Evolution of Life, which places fairies within the wider, ev the wider evolution of organic life as a whole. So down the middle column, we've got uh, our fairies, and they're, they're sort of higher order than birds and reptiles and insects. Uh, and then above that, we've got sylphs. And then, um, sort of, sorry, try, trying to work out which is which. There's a column for humans. We've got a sort of separate column for angels. And the fairies are somewhere in the middle. So uh, it's, it's just a really fantastic chart. And um, yeah, it's, it's also in Carol uh, G. Silver's book, Strange and Secret Peoples. So if you want to have a look at the, the chart, um, yeah, I should have tried to put it in the book as well, and uh, that would have been great. But anyway, it's amazing, so do, do take a look later. And the late 19th century is also a time when many technological developments are being made that seemed like magic. So we've got photography in the 1830s, the cinema in the 1890s, and x-rays in 1895. So you know, it's quite reasonable, really, to think that fairies might just simply exist outside of human perception. So, writing in 1910, the Manx folklorist Sophia Morrison suggested that even let it be granted that nine out of every ten cases of experiences with fairies can be analysed and explained away, there remains the tenth. And what used to be called supernatural is simply something that we don't understand at present. Our forefathers would have thought the telephone, the x-rays and wireless uh, telegraphy things supernatural. So early cinema also was a place of spectacle and illusion, and a um, bit, bit of a sidestep here, but the intersections of early cinema and magic shows are just really, really fascinating. So the filmmaker George Milliers, for instance, was a stage musician before he became a director, making a lot of uh, short films about fairy tales in the early 1900s, and you can really see this in his films. Uh, and another, another thing which... Um, uh, yeah, I, I could talk all day about this, because this is so interesting, but um, uh, we get butterfly dance films, um, so this is a trend that became popular in the late 1890s and early 1900s, also captured dancers performing serpentine dancers or butterfly dancers, where the dancers performed wearing these huge, beautiful flowing costumes and then they'd hand tint the films. Uh, so one filmmaker I wanted to share with you is Alice Guy Blaché. She was a French director who was also possibly the first woman filmmaker. So again, it's, it's going back to this idea of Conan Doyle's that they might be part insect um, and here you've got these dancers that are sort of you know partially human uh, partially insect maybe partially fairy and in the also on film as well so there's extra layer of unreality so I think they're a really nice intersection with things like the cottony fairies photographs you know it's part of a much wider um, trend so of course there are many um, intersections as well between fairies and spiritualism which also is something that, that gained uh, hugely in popularity uh, during in the aftermath of the first world war so many spiritualists and theosophists and occultists made arguments for belief in fairies and scientific grounds often drawing on popularized ideas about evolution in much the same way as charles ledbetter that we just saw so the founder of theosophy helen blavatsky uh, wrote that um, under the general designation of fairies and fays, these spirits of the elements appear in the myth, fable, tradition, or poetry of all nations, ancient and modern. And these elementals are the principal agents of disembodied but never visible spirits at seances. So again, we're getting this like um, explicit link made between spirits and fairies. So this is an, another case that is uh, discovered in doing my research, which is completely fascinating. So in 1929, the mysterious death of a young woman, uh, Marie Emily Fenario, known as Netta, attracted widespread attention. So she was a member of the Hermetic Order of the, Gordon, sorry, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and had traveled there after reading the work of fellow Golden Dawn member William Sharp in search of what she called green ray elementals. Um, so he, uh, her body was found uh, on, Iona, on the island of Iona 
uh, wearing only a black and silver chain, and there were several newspaper reports speculating about things like blue lights being seen by her body. Uh, so this is from uh, Reynolds Illustrated News, but there were many reports uh, of her death and exactly what had caused it. And, and it's sort of been written into Iona uh, travel guides a little bit later. So, oh, it's, you know, she went to see the fairies and then bad things happened to her. So it's, you know, it's, um, fairies are very much part of that conversation. So in this, it's really easy to see um, how Conan Doyle's story captured the popular imagination. And it's out of all of this wider context that the stories collected in Fierce and Fairies are written. So altogether, they span 150 years of weird fairy fiction. The earliest one is Charlotte Riddell's The Banshee's Warning uh, in 1867. And the most recent is Jane Alexander's In Yon Green Hill to Dwell, which is a retelling of Tamlin from 2014. They're all but one set in the British Isles, and most of them draw directly on older folk tales. So I want to just talk, a few, talk about a few of these now to give you a little flavour of what is in the book. So there's some stories set in England, and these often have a quite folk horror flavour, exploring the clash between the modern and the urban, and darker forces lurking in the landscape. Um, so this is a strong theme in 19th century England as well, this idea that you know, the fairies are already gone, uh, pushed out of the way by industrialisation and the modern world. So, um, and of course it comes out of the Romantic movement as well. Um, Samuel Drew, his history of Cornwall from the earliest records and tradition to the present time, published in 1824, laments that the age of piskies, like that of chivalry, is gone. There is perhaps at present hardly a house where they're reputed to visit. Uh, and of course, this is something that goes back much further. Notably, uh, he's actually talking about Chaucer's The Wife of Bath's Tale uh, when he's discussing this. And literally in Chaucer's The Wife of Bath's Tale, it says, oh, well, you know, we don't have any fairies anymore, not like in the olden days. So it's, it's, a, it's a recurring refrain. And it goes, uh, well, it goes uh, back to the Middle Ages and beyond that. Um, but um, one example that, again, from the 14th century we see is Sir Garwin and the Green Knight. Um, recently made into a film with Dev Patel. Uh, so this is arguably, I would say, a story about a formidable fairy in the form of the Green Knight. So in Fierce and Fairies itself, uh, we've got Algernon Blackwood's The Trod from 1946. Uh, and this is very much on this theme. Its protagonist is a wealthy, uh, maybe a little self-satisfied young man called Norman, who, when we meet him at the beginning, is off on a grouse shoot uh, into the northern English moors. He's, he's very happy about this, and he's being enticed there by a beautiful girl he meets in London. And so it, we meet him on the uh, being whirled in one of the newest streamlined expresses towards the north. He leaned back in his first-class smoker and lit a cigarette. So as you might expect, without giving away the whole story, this, this nice, comfortable beginning uh, is not necessarily where he ends up. Uh, it reminds me quite of E.F. Benson's stories, actually, this really urbane protagonist in a, in a modern world that, that slowly disintegrates. So moving away from England, the Celtic revival of the 19th and early 20th centuries also revitalised interest in the fairy lore of Ireland and Scotland, uh, with many writers reporting widely on and sometimes endorsing fairy beliefs, such as W.B. Yeats, um, who's a little bit circumspect. He writes um, several articles in support of fairy belief and he writes about it in his books, but he, he sort of is a bit cagey as to whether he personally uh, believes or not. Um, but he just says this, which I think is it's sort of, you know, sitting on the fence quite gracefully. The things a man has heard and seen are threads of life, so any who will... Can, any who will can weave them into whatever garments of belief please them best. So a large number of the stories in Fierce and Fairies are by Irish, Scottish and Welsh writers. We've got Arthur Macken, for instance, his The White People, and Charlotte Riddell, who I just mentioned, her story The Banshee's Warning, which uh, situates a banshee in 1860s Soho. Um, so another writer that I've included is William Sharp, who uh, wrote in the form of a, an elaborately constructed literary alter ego uh, in the form of a shy young woman called Fiona MacLeod. So again, uh, his story is, is really fascinating. I don't have, unfortunately, space to go into it here. I talk about him a little bit in the book as well, but, but his, his life and work is really interesting. And writing as Fiona MacLeod, Sharp wrote several volumes of folklore-infused stories 
including the one in this collection by the Yellow Moon Rock, where he meets a vampiric fairy. So there are several different uh, vampire fairies in, in various traditions, such as the uh, Bavan Shi, uh, where, which we're told in Donald Mackenzie's Scottish folklore from 1935, is uh, something that might appear as a crow or raven, or as a beautiful girl wearing a long green dress which conceals the deer hooves she has instead of feet. So, uh, yeah, maybe not a creature that you, you want to come across. The Lamia as well, we've got Waterhouse's uh, the Lamia here, uh, another variety of, of this kind of sort of snaky, vampiric fairy. Um, so, yeah, that story deals with uh, one of those. And as well as being vampiric, um, often at the same time, these fairies are very good at enticing and seducing humans. And there's a long tradition of seductive and sexually transgressive fairies of all genders. So, for instance, in Angela Carter's The Earl King, which, again, is one I've included, which draws in both the Goethe poem The Earl King and Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, we see a goblin feast of fruit being laid out by the seductive but deadly Earl King. And, of course, we have the Goblin King himself, moving uh, forward to 1986, David Berry as Jareth in Jim Henson's Labyrinth. So, uh, yeah, another, another Earl King figure. And we also see associations between fairies and non-heteronormative sexuality in the use of the word fairy, for instance, to mean an effeminate or gay man in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So it became uh, used as a pejorative term by straight society, but was also used within the queer community at the time. So if you want to read more about this, George Chauncey's Gay New York is a really uh, fascinating read on this topic. Uh, and more recently, the term was reclaimed in the title of a great short story collection from 2007, uh, So Fay, Queer Fairy Fiction, where its editor writes, Fairyland also promises freedom from the restraints of society and the dominant patriarchy and holds the elusive possibility of acceptance. So I just want to go back to Labyrinth for a minute and show you a very short clip from this because it, it just fits with so many fairy motifs. Uh, and again, I you know, very much include this story in my, my corpus, even if it's not, it can't be in the book. So I'm just going to just show you this. I'm sure everyone will be familiar with it. So this is at the beginning of the film. So for those um, who might not know the story, uh, oh, no, hang on. Uh, Sarah uh, is a young girl who has to babysit her baby brother. She's not happy about it. And she wishes that the Goblin King would come and take her brother away. And of course, the Goblin King does indeed show up and take her brother away. So this is when she realizes that her brother has been taken and meets the Goblin King, who is David Bowie. But yeah, again, fantastic film. If by chance you haven't seen it, do do yourself a favor and go watch it because it's, it's wonderful. Anyway, this brings us really nicely to the next type of fairy we're going to talk about. Oh, you didn't. Hang on. He, he won't disappear. Hang on, let's... let's uh... There we go. There we go. He's, he's, he's vanquished for now. <laughs> All right. This brings us to changelings. So uh, the belief that fairies might steal a human child or a human adult and leave a doppelganger in its stead can be found in folk traditions around the world. Uh, so we've got the Obanje in Nigeria, for instance, and Scandinavian stories about children taken by trolls. And the Irish writer Speranza, or Lady Wilde, uh, Oscar Wilde's mother, uh, who wrote uh, a collection of Irish folklore, tells us that sometimes it is said that the fairies carry off the mortal child for a sacrifice. And beautiful young girls are carried off also, either for sacrifice or to be wedded to the fairy king. So this belief had uh, real-world consequences in a, in a number of cases, most notoriously and tragically in the case of Bridget Cleary, who was a young Irish woman in 1895 whose family burned her alive after believing that she was a changeling. And it um, was, a, again, received a lot of uh, media coverage um, and a lot of attention. So there are a few stories in Fierce and Fairies that talk about changelings, probably most explicitly uh, Marjorie Lawrence's uh, the, the case of the Liavan Shi, uh, which explicitly mentions a fairy child. So this is a story from uh, Lawrence's wonderful Number 7 Queer Street from 1945, which is the casebook of her occult detective Miles Pennoyer going through his different cases. So again, the whole collection's amazing. Um, so, yeah, she has a, he meets a woman, Mrs. Flaherty, who has a young son who's giving them anxiety, and, of course, he goes to see what's, what's happening, and there are supernatural forces at play. 
Uh, another one uh, that I wanted to just uh, name check is uh, the Green Children of Woolpit. So this is the uh, inspiration for probably my favorite story in the whole book, which is Randolph Stowe's um, an extract from his uh, 1980 novel, The Girl Green is Elderflower, which is a retelling of this story. And it is just, yeah, again, the whole novel is, is wonderful, but I've just put a bit of it in, in the book. Uh, so this was uh, a story found in a medieval chronicle, a couple of medieval chronicles, uh, one of them, Ralph of Coggeshall, who in his Chronicum Glorum, um, which is, uh, as you rightly said, it's a, it's a chronicle, it's a history of things that were happening, and he just includes a few stories about comment um, of like wonderful things that happened and one of them is a boy and a girl that were found um, near the mouth of a pit in St. Mary of the Woolpits and they had green skin uh, and they, they couldn't speak uh, the language of the country that they were in, they would only eat beans uh, and later when they did learn English they revealed that they were from St. Martin's land underground. So again, really mysterious uh, story and people have speculated about what's, what's going on. But anyway, it's uh, in uh, Girl Green as Elderflower. And of course, I couldn't not mention Peter Pan in a talk about fairies. So Barry's Peter has become iconic, and the first story that I've included, um, the sto sorry, the story that I've included from Barry uh, is called Lockout Time, uh, first written in 1902, but also uh, republished in 1906, is a precursor to the much better known play Peter Pan. So that, of course, is a play that demands that its audience uh, express a belief in fairies by clapping when Tinkerbell is likely to die. Um, so Peter Pan, it's, it is a much darker story than I think it initially appears, and again, probably more so than it's given credit for uh, today. Uh, so here we see a changing story from the perspective of the changelings, um, you know, which is all well and good, but what happens when they want to go back? So in lockout time, we see Peter, in, he's uh, gone away from his home, uh, he comes back to look, looking through the window at his mother, but he, you know, he's, he's and he's divided as to whether he actually wants to go back because the freedom of being in the gardens, not even having to wear clothes, is um, you know, maybe a much more attractive option. And again, looking ahead to our 1980s horror fantasy films, the 1987 film The Lost Boys is a really, really fascinating iteration of this. So if people haven't seen this, the premise is essentially, what if The Lost Boys and Peter Pan were actually secretly vampires? So... Again, thinking back to the vampire fairies we met earlier, this is perhaps uh, an entirely logical premise. So again, these sort of you know, threatening, but also fantastical uh, creatures um, that you know, we're not entirely sure how they fit in. So my collection stops in 2014, uh, but stories about fairies are still being produced and continuing to evolve. So here are just a, a few examples to finish with um, that I wanted to flag up. So Victor Laval's uh, novel, The Changeling, which uh, from 2017, which again, really brilliant uh, retelling of a changing story from the perspective of a father who loses his son in modern day New York. Uh, Carnival Row with Orlando Bloom and Cara Delvine on Netflix, which I, yeah, I did. I've, I've got sort of mixed feelings about, so it'd be interesting to see, see what other people think, but I do think it looks beautiful and the fairy mythology is really interesting. And lastly, Catler from this year. Uh, it's an Icelandic drama um, about um, doppelgangers or changelings that start to come back following a volcanic eruption of people that have disappeared uh, recently. So, all, all really good things. I uh, would encourage you to check them all out. So fairies are basically not going anywhere. So now we're up to date in 2021. This brings us to a close. So if um, you've got any questions, uh, any thoughts about fairies, happy to take some questions. But yeah, this is the book. Do keep in touch. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Eliza Dernley. Uh, and my website's elizabethdernley.co.uk. Thank you so much.